of blood cells, where all bl red blood cells are produced and where a number of other cells are produced. Let's try to shake out the cobwebs a little bit and think about what types of cells are in blood. I have letters A through D on this slide here. If you could in the chat, try to enter a response for each letter. So what would A be in this picture? What would B be? What would C be? What would D be? I'll give you a hint. It was covered in our last lesson. It's in the notes. So let's take the next 30 seconds to think about it and enter our responses in the chat. We got answers coming in, they're coming in hot. Let's give ourselves 10 more seconds. So C is a, it's a trickier one. If you recall, it's the one that causes clotting, it dries up our blood. We get like a paper cut. It's what causes blood to clot. And then D, just look at the color. I think that's the best hint or clue. Yeah. Excellent. So all responses I'm seeing are look to be correct. So we have A is white blood cell, so like a lymphocyte. B is plasma. You'll recall it's kind of got all the goodies in it, like fats and proteins. C's are platelets. D's are red blood cells. We covered a lot in the last lesson. We talked about Know, how bone marrow produces uh, or contributes to blood supply and replacing blood. But we're missing one crucial feature to this story. And it has to do with how does our skeletal system know when to activate or inhibit cell growth. So you can see from this picture here, we have kind of on the left is an image of spongy bone. So that's an epithesis the long bone it appears, and you can see the vasculature circulating throughout. That's where blood is gonna flow through. And on the top of that bone is where there's red bone marrow. So that's gonna be where blood cells are produced. I wonder how does our bone, like skeletal system know when to crank out these cells or when to stop cell growth? Because as you can see from the picture to the right, things can get crowded pretty quickly if it's constantly cranking out high volumes of cells. Anyone have any thoughts about how our body knows when to produce or when to stop producing cells? Hmm. I'm not sure if you're asking me or not, but I actually, I'm wondering that now too, but I'm thinking it has to be some sort of homeos, the way, the way that they're checking for homeostasis. So it probably has to do with some kind of brain or, you know, sensing from some, from some way. Does our body have a way to sense our volume of blood? Or are you, or is it actually in the, 
is there a signal sent from some other cell or yeah, don't answer good, yet. Maybe other kids will have questions. <laughs> those are good wonderings. I definitely think the keyword you said was signal. What do others think? Maybe it has to do something with like neurons and after a part of the skin or whatever is ruptured or there's an intrusion, neurons send a signal over to the bones to tell them about it. That, yeah, that could be definitely one possibility. So for the sake of today's story, oh and Harry, I think I appreciate you, by the way, for speaking <laughs> up. Um, that takes a little bit of courage, and I think that was an excellent guess. So when we talk about kind of homeostasis, this is sort of a regulation story. And regulation is driven by what is called hormones. And hormones are, we can think of them as like signal molecules. So in our red blood cell story, we see that when our body senses, say, a low red blood cell supply, which is also a low oxygen supply, this is harmful. It's harmful to tissues. Like, there's a reason why when we have low oxygen, we get tired, fatigued, dizzy. Our tissues require oxygen. Our organs require oxygen. So when our body is hit with this stimulus of low oxygen, it secretes hormones. And so in the red blood cell story, our kidneys actually secrete a hormone that's called EPO. I'm going to butcher this name, but it's erythropoietin <laughs> EPO for short. I'll call it EPO from here out. And EPO is secreted and actually sent out through the circulatory system. So it's going to go down, travel around the body uh, to target cells. And those target cells are actually in our case, in bone marrow. And once uh, the hormones bind to bone marrow, they're gonna activate target cell production. So if you can think back when we're talking about bone marrow and in your kind of research uh, for the last assignment, you probably came across the word stem cells in bone marrow. So what's cool about bone marrow is it has a bunch of stem cells that are just waiting. They're not yet designated to produce a certain type of cell. So if I'm a stem cell, I don't know yet if I'm going to become a red blood cell, if I'm going to be a white blood cell, or if I'm going to be a platelet. But when a hormone comes by and binds to my stem cell receptor, then all of a sudden I'm drafted. So if EPO comes and binds to my receptor, I know I'm going to start cranking out red blood cells because the body's in low oxygen supply and I got to start carrying around oxygen to the rest of the body and save the day. So that is kind of this regula regulation story of blood cells and oxygen. Uh, it's also, this is how hormones are, you know, involved in every homeostasis story, really. They're going to be hit with a stimulus. Your body's going to somehow secrete uh, specific hormones that are in charge of specific production. They will travel around the body, bind, and crank out whatever types of cells uh, the body needs to get in balance again. And then finally, there's this termination piece. So like when uh, the body senses that we've cranked out enough oxygen and we're back at homeostasis, it turns off that hormone production. Therefore, it turns off kind of that rapid production of blood cells. So what would be a good example of when your body's uh, low in oxygen? when you've lost a lot of red blood cells. Can someone think of something? When might you lose a lot of red blood cells? They're found in blood. If you get a cut. Yeah. How about a big cut? Let's talk about like, car accident type cut. 
or a gunshot wound. I think of the ER when I think of instances when uh, there is a need for blood transfusions or there's a need for EPO, like, hey, our body needs a lot of RBCs produced, uh, red blood cells produced now. So that's a good example, Sophia, of when EPO would get cranked out. So the other two examples I have, and this is going to be a part of your reading for the next couple days. Uh, this is an assignment on Schoology. I want you to review uh, specific hormone stories for oxygen homeostasis. So this is related to our bone marrow. And also calcium homeostasis. So we talked a lot about bone remodeling. So this is where we're going to find out about the calcium homeostasis story and what types of hormones are involved in that. So our schedule for the next couple days, uh, we'll go, you're going to read the notes, uh, those two slides, they're kind of a cheat sheet to hormones. And then I posted this really cool article by Oregon State University on Schoology. This one unpacks exercise, nutrition, and hormones, uh, all the major players involved in bone remodeling and calcium homeostasis. So as you think about your bone pathology project and you get to the whole like what hormones are involved in this story, that's going to be an excellent resource for you. And in fact, I encourage you to read it and reference it as one of your citations when we look at bone pathology. So I want to shift gears. First of all, before we do that, what questions do you have about hormones? 